I think as you probably all know that in this church, like um, a lot of churches, we follow a thing called the lectionary. It's a rather complicated word. It simply means a calendar. And the calendar simply means that uh, it doesn't run for 12 months like ours, but it runs over three years. And the idea of the whole thing of the calendar is that uh, during that three-year period, on each Sunday and each special day, there's a new different reading from the, from the Old Testament, the Psalms and New Testament and the, and the epistles, so that we, we don't miss out on anything in the Bible. We go into every little, little nook and cranny. Now, the great advantage of this is that we don't miss things out. And it also certainly stops people like me preaching on my favourite topic all the time. I remember as a child we were on holidays up in the Mount, up in the Dandenongs, that was a big deal in those days, and going to the Methodist church at Sassafras. And uh, it was in the afternoon there and the lay preacher went on and on and on and on. <laughs> and even my parents who were very tolerant shuffled and wriggled and my father said after this is in the May holidays I don't think he'd preached since Christmas and we needed to know everything that happened since then <laughs> it was a long long sermon so it, it stops us from doing that unfortunately the bad side is not everything in the Bible is a happy or joyous just some pretty grim passages and at first sight and I emphasize at first sight when I, I read the Exodus story today I thought, oh dear, I've drawn, I've drawn the short straw for miserable sermons. I emphasise at first sight. Because it's a horrible reading. Threats, bloodthirsty, murder. It's horrible. I'm going to read it to you again. This time a slightly more modern version. Thanks to our good friend uh, Nathan Nettleton. He's of the South Yarra Community Baptist Church. He writes some wonderful modern stuff. After the king of Egypt had refused to listen to the morning, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Rewrite your calendars. From now on, this month is to be the beginning of the new year. Put the word out amongst the Israelites that on the tenth day of the month, exactly, the tenth day of the month, each household is to obtain a lamb or young goat. Small households can share, dividing up so there's enough for everyone. The lamb must be healthy and male yielding, no deformities, no seconds, not a runt. Having obtained the ram is to keep it for four days, exactly four days. And on the 14th, the Israelites had to slaughter the lamb for cooking. Take some of the blood and paint it over the door frames. Cook it and eat it that night. Don't serve it raw or boiled. Don't even cut it up or, or gut it. Spit roast the whole thing over the fire and serve it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Eat it all that night. Any left over in the morning, burn it. When you've eaten it, you to go you are eat it as if you're in a hurry and you are leaving on a journey. You should be dressed in your jack jacket, your backpack, your hiking boots <coughs> and your walking sticks. In this way you'll keep the peace of Passover in honour of me, the Lord. That night I'll go through Egypt and killing the firstborn sons of every family. And so it goes on. Pretty grim stuff, isn't it? Not quite the gentle Jesus, meek and mild that I was brought up in Sunday school to believe. God being loving and kind. So there must be a reason for all of this. So let's have a little bit closer and let's dissect some of the, a few messages out of this uh, grisly, grisly story. Firstly, God is saying to them, reset your calendar. Suddenly, this has to be the first day of something new. I think what he's implying is there, something new is about to happen. You're about to go on a journey. Now, bear in mind that the Israelites for hundreds of years have prayed to God, let us free, let us free. They'd been in Egypt for over 440 years and a long, lot of time they were slaves, captives and they're waiting to get free. Do you think God's giving a bit of a hint here? Eat as if you're about to go on a journey. He didn't actually say that but it's sort of like make preparations for something. So I think this is something that God is saying 
you're about to have a new beginning and you have to reset your calendar. This is the marker point. This is the start of a new life and a new journey. I remember when I was young and I had an old car where the, the fuel gauge wasn't too reliable. So when it said half full, it might have been nearly empty. And when it said empty, it might have been nearly full. So even now, I've got a habit, an old habit from those days. Whenever I fill up my car, even now, full, I reset the speedo. <laughs> do you do that too? Put the odometer back to naught. And I seem to remember, Greg can correct me here, but I seem to remember the Austin 840 had about eight gallons in the tank. And my father used to boast about doing 30 miles, 30 miles to the gallon. That meant I could go 240 miles on a tank of petrol, is not it? So it was pretty good. The, the odometer speedo acted as my fuel gauge. When I'd done 120 miles, I knew I had half a tank. So, you see, it wasn't just there to measure how far the, way, the car went, it went, it's there to measure how much petrol I had left. So I think God is saying to them, you must reset your calendars because today is going to be a very, very important day. They didn't know what it was. I don't think they even realised it. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. We've got to reset our calendars. That's, that's what he was telling the, the Israelites. Second thing that comes out of this reading is um, we're all the same in God's sight. Now when he says he's going to come around and uh, slaughter the firstborn, he makes no differentiation. You know in every good movie, in every good story, there are two famous characters in each one. Goodies and baddies. And the goodies, well they're not always entirely good and the baddies are not always that bad. But it's always the goodies and the baddies and hopefully you know, the goodies win over the baddies. Is that right? Yes, of course it is. And in the book of Exodus, we've been led to believe right throughout been led to believe that the Egyptians are the baddies and the Israelites are the goodies, right? After all, they're God's chosen people. So wouldn't you think that when God goes around and does some murders, he'd attack the baddies? But no. We're all the same in his sight. He's going to come around and kill the firstborn of everybody. But if you follow God's word... And there's all that slaughtering of the lamb and eating and radi radi ra. If you follow God's word and paint over the doorway, you can see it up there on the picture. They're not painting this house with Dulux or Torbans, they're daubing with blood, aren't they? That's as a sign to God that you have fulfilled his word and his command and you will be spared. And I think that's the message there. We're all the same, but if we follow God's command, we will be spared. The third thing was, I think the, Egypt, the Israelites really needed a sign. I wonder how many of them knew at this stage that they're about to be liberated. They needed a sign for something to happen. And actually, the sign came way back last week in the story of Moses and the burning bush, didn't it? There's Moses out there tending his father-in-law's flock and suddenly there appears a burning bush. Now, that's not uncommon over there. Just like here, you know our... The, the most dangerous thing in our bushland here is not the undergrowth and the debris and all that. It's the gum trees themselves, full of eucalyptus oil, which is highly flammable. And I don't know if you've seen it. I haven't seen actually. I've seen it on videos where there's a bushfire, flames and flames, and suddenly the bush, uh, a gum tree down here suddenly bursts into flame. It's called spontaneous combustion. Just the heat of what's going on here causes it to burn without even the flames touching it. So he, Moses sees one of these and he thinks, oh, it's just another one of those things that's exploded. But the voice of God comes up through them and says, Moses, you're the leader. You're going to lead the people out. Now, wouldn't you think at that stage Moses had a clue that a journey was on the way? But instead of that, he sounds like old Jim Trot in the uh, Vicar of Dibley, doesn't he? No, 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 no. But instead of no, 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 yes, he says, no, 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 no. Can't you send me somewhere else? And then there's a bit of an argument goes on there with God, but finally he says, no, 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 yes. And he decides to go off. But I wonder if then he realised just how soon that the release from captivity was going to be. They were all looking for a sign. Not only had they looked for a sign, they had to give a sign to God that they were ready to go. So what's that got all to do with us? 
What's the relevance of all this today? I have a, a very good friend of mine called name of Ivan, not that matters, you wouldn't know him. And he's a very devout Jew. His spiritual advisor, as he calls it, him, is his uh, rabbi at his church in St Kilda. And when some of us get together and we are absolutely fascinated by Ivan, some of Ivan's rabbi stories, the wisdom that come from some of these I'll call old time wisdom wise preachers and the uh, people of God I call them, it's just absolutely amazing. His rabbi stories really enthralls us. Interesting, this rabbi embraces our whole Bible. The, I call it the Christian Bible. Not just the Old Testament, that's the Jewish bit of it, but the New Testament. He embraces the stories of Jesus, even though he doesn't acknowledge Jesus as perhaps the Son of God. He acknowledges the stories of Jesus and the stories in the New Testament. In fact, he says, the Bible is not a theological book. It's not theological instruction. It's not religious instruction. It's not even a history book. Ivan looks upon the Bible as a book of lessons. So we might read the lessons of Isaiah, the lessons of Matthew, the lessons in the Psalm. So what are the lessons here today? I always thought the book of Exodus was about that well, the Exodus, the Israelites being re released from Egypt and going out and back to the Promised Land. Of course, there's been movies made about it and if you're listening carefully about it, there was a wonderful musical theme called the theme from the movie Exodus. I was playing it before the service as immortalised by Ferranti and Taishu when I was a little boy. So um, what's the lessons that we can learn from the book of Exodus? Let's look beyond Beyond God being orderly, ordering or making orders, let's look beyond God making threats. Let's be, look beyond God being a murderer and let's find out what it is. Firstly, like I said before, I think the thing that we have to learn is that we need a new beginning. I don't think anyone would disagree in the churches these days. We've sort of dare I say, bumbled on for a long, long time and by gosh, we need a new beginning, don't we? The Uniting Church has a wonderful document and a, a study going on at the moment and you'll read about a bit more about it in this week's newsletter. Uh, it's called Act Two. Now, that's not a new book in the Bible. It's not the misspelling of a, a book that's there already. It's Act Two, like in plays. You go to see a play and there's... Act 1 and Act 2 and perhaps 3 and 4. And in a sense, Act 1 is the church as it has been up to now. Act 2 is the church from now onwards. It's like we've reset the speedo, reset the calendar. Now, what is the future? It makes fascinating reading what they've come up with. Some of it very encouraging, some of it quite disturbing. But we have to face ourselves and work out what it is. We need a new beginning. The next thing is that we, we're all the same. And especially here in, um, at Black Rock, we're all the same. I, I must say that uh, as, as a member, a person who came here from Cheltenham, and before Cheltenham I came from Mentone Church, as I stand here today, <laughs> At Black Rock, I must say, I feel a bit like the Israelites in Egypt, a bit of a captive. Now, I won't say the Black Rock people are the, the cruel masters, not at all. <laughs> and I won't say I'm a slave, but I'm feeling enslaved. You forget what I mean, trapped? I'm feeling that way. I'm looking for a new beginning. And we're all the same. We're all the same here. And we've done, done a bit about this. We're now one congregation, aren't we? One congregation, a new congregation, a new beginning. We're all the same. In two weeks' time, our separate, have been separate church councils are meeting here to work out the nuts and bolts of how we're going to be the one council. So we're in, pre in preparation and readiness to go. So what we need now is a sign. And like 
the Israelites, we need to receive a sign and give a sign. We need to re receive a sign that something, a journey is going to happen and my gosh, have we been longing for it. Please God, when are you going to let us go? When are we going on that wonderful journey to the promised land in Cheltenham? <laughs> if you get the message, get the idea. So we need a sign. Dare I say if you came to church one Sunday morning and Alan Miller had a big smile on his face <laughs> and he was doing cartwheels and somersaults down the aisle, it could be a sign that, yes, something has happened. But uh, you might notice that sometime now Alan has now decided he's going to be sitting in the congregation for a while. He has done such an incredible job to bring about signs and he's... Um, He's decided to take a little rest from, uh, from that well-deserved. I think he's just getting ready for the somersaults and the handsprings. <laughs> but, and also thanks Barbara who has taken over his job. He's been doing that job for uh, about 130 years now. <laughs> Bit of an exaggeration. He said it feels like it. But uh, Barbara's got her old plates on and she, she's progressing to the P plates pretty quickly. But... Uh, it's, it's good to see that Alan's just having a little break from things. That, that's, that's good. So the sign, we need to see a sign. And we need to give a sign. What's the point of us just going up there to Cheltenham when the new building's finished and sitting down the same way as you do every Sunday? No point at all. We need to have a sign out to the people. And there will be signs outside the church and we have to give a sign. We're working on that. We're hoping to introduce, while we're waiting, in the waiting period, some perhaps some mission studies so that we can know and learn how we can reach out to the people around us. We're looking for that. So they were looking for an answer, the Israelites. You've made us do this, God, what's happening? Strange thing was that the sign didn't come from God himself. The sign came from Pharaoh, the enemy, because he came to them after the, all the firstborn had slain and he said, listen here, he called uh, Moses and Aaron, listen here you lot, I'm sick of you lot, pack up, go. Pack your bags and go. Now, were they ready? Well, we hope, like a God has said, when you eat this meal, when you celebrate this meal, be dressed, and I said in your robes, and it said have your sandals on and your stick. Even the original uh, Old Testament tells us that. So are we ready to go now? How prepared for, are we to go forward? Perhaps there are signs around now that we don't even see. It was interesting last week, Alan Millard after the service, because he sat in the congregation for the first time in a long time, he said, you know, it was great sitting in the congregation. He's always up there worrying about the laptop computer and the sound levels and the plugs and that. He said, I sat in the, there were things happening in the service I didn't notice. So perhaps there are things going on here around us there are signs that we're not taking notice of. There's a very old story and please forgive me if you've heard it 300 times but uh, if there may be somebody who hasn't but I think it's relevant now about watching out for signs. It's about a little country town and it wasn't Bunyip because we're up on a hill here in Bunyip but the rain had come and the river was rising and it's quite interesting quite often you'll see on the news Flood warnings, flood warnings for the Bunyip River. And I often get phone calls, you all right, David? Well, where the Bunyip town is, it's about 50, 70 metres above the, <laughs> the river, so we're quite all right. But in this little town, the, the, the waters were coming up and the, the townsfolk were all ordered to leave. But there was one man there. He was a devout, devout faithful servant of the good Lord and he, he wasn't going to move. And he's coming there and there and the water's coming up and up and along comes a little rowing boat and they said, quick, quick, hop in the boat, we'll save you. He said, no, 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 I've been a good and faithful servant of the Lord. He said, the God will save me. And still the water comes up and by this time he's up on the table, kitchen table. And uh, just then another, uh, a, row, a motorboat comes past. And he says, quick, quick, jump in, we'll take you away and save you. He says, no, no, I've been a good and faithful servant, righty The God will save me. And by this time he's up on the roof, the water's up so high and it's coming up around his neck when the helicopter comes along. 
We'll throw you a line. We'll throw you a line and haul you to safety. He says, no, 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 no. He says, uh, God will save me, I'm okay. Well, the water kept coming up and right over his head and the poor chap, he drowned. But being a good, faithful servant of the Lord, he goes to heaven. And there he is at the pearly gates facing St Peter. Welcome, says St Peter, you're being a good and faithful man, come in. He said, oh, it's all right, St Peter, but look, I'm not too pleased with God. He said, I... You know, he said, I've been a good and faithful servant all these years. And he said, God let me drown. He said, I want to have a word with him. All right, Peter says, I'll arrange any arrange He meets God. What's the problem, says God? Well, I've been a faithful, good and faithful servant all these years. And look at this, I'm only 40 years old and you mate, let me drown. And God said, he said, well, he says, I, I sent two boats and a helicopter. What else did you want? So are we ignoring the boats and the helicopters that are around us now? I don't have any magical answers for us, but if I do think of one thing, perhaps, perhaps we've spent too much time trying to create a future for the church. We've been so possessed with looking to the future that uh, we've ignored the present and perhaps not looked back on the past. Perhaps we've uh, been so busy trying to create a future for God here when in fact I believe it's not us who makes the future for God, it's God who gives us the future. 